be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that Yahweh has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that Yahweh Shabbat Shalom. Well, you guys are getting better at that. That's really cool. Okay. Hey, just a few announcements. You may be seated. Um, seniors, on June 25th, Tuesday at 1130, they have a lunch at China Faith. China Faith. Does anybody know where China Faith is? Oh, where's the owner? She's gone. <laughs> oh, well. I was going to rub, rub that in a little bit. We also have Russ Houck that's going to be talking on Sunday, June 23rd. He's talking about some revisions on his book. And he's also going to be talking about some things that, that happened while he was in South Africa as well. Um, and we'll, we'll have him here for the day. Wow, I'm loud. The day. Okay, now we're going to, okay, there we go. The, we're gonna, he's going to be talking to us about the day. Boy, I, he, I give him a lot of control back there, man. <laughs> mm -hmm. about, about his trip to South Africa, they spent, um, I think it was close to two months in South Africa, and some, there's some great things happening in Africa. Um, also, I'm going to turn, I'm going to bring... Uh, Mitchell and up here and talk about a future fundraiser that's going to be happening here. Shalom, everybody. It's on. Okay. Shalom, everybody. I uh, just want to thank everyone who came to the last yard sale at Kathy Pack's house and brought things and bought things and just so humbling and such a blessing to see how Yahweh's putting together this bomb shelter renovation in Israel. We have an ongoing fundraiser that will be going until September that we um, have tickets for drawings. The information's on the wall. But uh, you can see I think big, so. Um, and this says on it, Naharia or bust, so. <laughs> um, we have that going. And then Cornerstone is going to be hosting another garage sale. We've been very successful with those, so why not? So on the 23rd of June at 10 o'clock, Russ is later in the day, you can come and help us price things, give me a call, or um, there are others that you can contact too about bringing things over here. We have some storage here now for the yard sale, and then that will be on July 7th, which is a Sunday from 9 o'clock to 3 p.m. Did I get everything right, Sharon? Okay, thank you very much, and thank you again for blessing Israel. Okay, if you stand for the reading of Scripture, I'm going to be reading out of Psalm 91. Psalm 91. How many of you, um, by the way, have come to your Shabbat and you're getting ready and you seem really anxious, you feel really anxious, and just everything seems to be going like this? I was that way this morning. And so my wife came out and she says, Honey, have you read Psalm 91 lately? So I, I listened, and I did. And here's what it says. It says, The one who lives under the protection of the Most High dwells in the shadow of, of the Almighty. I will say to, to the Lord, My refuge in my fortress, my God in, in whom I trust, He Himself will deliver you from the, from the hunter's net, from destructive plague. He will cover you with His feathers, and you will take refuge under his wings. His, faithful, his faithfulness will be a, a protective shield. You will not fear the terror of the night, the arrow that flies by day, the plague that stalks in darkness, or the pestilence that ravages at noon. Though a thousand fall at your side and 10,000 at your hand, the pestilence will not reach you. You will only see it with your eyes and witness the punishment of the wicked. Here's what I want you to understand. 
when he was talking about the one who lives under the protection of the Most High dwells in his shadows of his wing. And he was talking about that he, he himself will deliver you the hunter's net, and it says he will cover you with his feathers. You know what? There's one thing to be covered with his feathers, but in the original language, you know what it says? It says we're intertwined in his feathers. And you know what? I don't know about you, but there's one thing to be standing in front of a wing, and there's another one, another thing that's, that's to be entwined in it and, and, and hidden from your enemy. Isn't that amazing? And you know what? It's just what I needed to hear this morning. Because the truth is, all of us have this because of him. We're all, we're all have the ability to be intertwined in, in his feathers and his wings and be, be in that refuge, in that place of protection. But you know what? When we get focused on the stuff instead of the protector, we step out in front of his wings. Amen? Father, I thank you for this time that you've given us today. As we go into this time, I ask that you remind us of who you are. I ask that you remind us of your desire for us. I ask that you remind us for, of your love for us. And the, the idea, Father, that you are our place of protection. You are the place of our focus. And if we'll just focus on you, just like he said in his word, if we'll just focus on you, we'll see people fall at our right and our left, and we'll see people fall all around us. But the point is, is that he saw him fall, the writer says, but he himself did not fall because you had him. So, Father, as we go into this, I not only ask that you remind us of that, but that you cause us to rejoice because of that and to praise you, and to lift it up to you this morning. In the name of Yeshua, amen. Holy is your name, Father. Yahweh is beautiful. Yes. Your grace abounds, your grace abounds. 
burn bright and clear Replace the lamp My first love That burns with holy fear Father, we just praise you today Holy is your name You are righteous and holy And good and faithful to us It's because of your goodness that we are here And we praise you and thank you today For everything that you've given to us, Father And I, I 
will praise Him, come what is.
good to me. Yeshua, you're good. Yeshua, you're good. Yeshua, you're good to me. Praise your Father. Praise your Father. Praise your Father. I was just going to read this. This is a. A short snippet from Revelation in Isaiah, and I really like it. It just says, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and who is to come, you are worthy, Yahweh, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by you they exist. Blessing and honor and glory and power to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. I just want to praise him this morning, and he's worthy, and we want to purify our hearts so we can be ready to stand before him.
I just pray that you just show us all those things that um, are the strongholds of the devil. We rebuke them in the name of Yeshua. We don't want them. We don't want those strongholds. We want to be free. I just pray that you would just show us those things that are in our hearts, that are um, um, the things that hold us back, the things that hold us down, that in relationships, in in work, in life, in friendships, Father. Open our hearts. Search our hearts and, and show us what is there, Father, that um, you don't want, that's holding us back, that's keeping us from reflecting you to the world, That you, uh, the, 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 the witness that you want us to be. It's keeping us back. And so I just pray, Father, that your holy fire would just burn away those things. us and fill us with your spirit, fill us with holiness, with goodness, with the, with the things that Yeshua showed us so we could live and walk after him, Father, 
And I just, tr I just want to know those things that are, we overlook, that we're blind to. Father, search our hearts. And uh, I just pray to you this morning, Father. If you're here today and you need prayer, if you would just move toward the back and those that will be praying for them, if you'd meet them back there, we'll take a little time and do some prayer for, for each other. Uh, as you said in the pews, please turn to one another and pray for each other uh, and pray for those that are praying as well. Thank you.
Thank you. Maybe we could have the men come forward to hold the tleet for the blessing of the children. Baruch Hashem Yahweh. Hallelujah. Could you all rise? Okay. Do you guys all have, does anybody have a Siddur? The Sabbath prayer is in the Siddur. And I have a couple extra copies. So we don't have it up on the screen. Anybody want one? Now I have to get my glasses. It happens at a certain age. I know you guys know because you were laughing. It's at, kind of towards the back on page 37, for those of you that have a Sidor. Okay. So you extend your hands toward the children. Let's sing the Sabbath prayer together. May Yahweh protect and defend you. May He always shield you from shame. May you come to be in Israel a shining name. May you be like Ruth and like Boaz. May you be deserving of praise. Strengthen them, Yahweh, and keep them from the stranger's ways. May Yahweh bless you and grant you long lives. May he send you spouses who will care for you. May Yahweh protect and defend you. May Yahweh preserve you from pain. Favor them, Yahweh, with happiness and peace. Oh, hear our Sabbath prayer. Amen. May Yahweh protect and defend you. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's give the children a hand.
on now. <laughs> Can you hear me now? <laughs> okay, I, I hate it when it was my problem. <laughs> okay, anyway, um, it's easier to blame it on the sound guy, you know. <laughs> anyway, the, 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 the whole idea that he, he's trying to promote here is that this is Messiah. And we find it out in, in like the first chapter when he says that, that John the Baptist, okay, and I, he kind of, it, it seems like he kind of takes on this role from John the Baptist to explain about Messiah. Because if you remember, John the Baptist said that he, he had asked, he'd been praying about who the Messiah was. And it had been revealed to him, Yahweh had revealed it to him, that it would be the one that the Ruach came and dwelled on, or set on, or rested on, right? And he said that the reason that he showed John this was so that John could reveal to Israel their Messiah. Okay, now that, that's, that's interesting because really um, the gospel that we teach today goes something like this. Okay, Yeshua or Jesus is our Savior and you just got to put your faith in him. Okay? Now, I'm not saying that we don't need to put our faith in him. That's not what I'm saying. But the point is, is even Israel and, and, and even Judah, it had to be revealed who the Messiah was. And there were specific things to look for in Messiah, right? And so really, when we present the gospel, we really sell the gospel short by saying this is all you got to do. You know, we're not teaching people who he is, what he came to. For instance, can I ask you a question? Can you find any place in Scripture in a, where the Gentiles were off looking for a Messiah? No. So if, 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 if he was to be revealed as Messiah, who was his target audience? Yeah. And, you know, he says it. He says, I only came for the lost sheep of Israel. Okay, and we find him. Where do we find him? We find him in Cana, which is in the northern kingdom. At this time of this first sign. Right? Okay, the first sign that he was Messiah was in the northern kingdom. Do you see what he was doing? And we talked about this, this city that was named Cana. And, and really, if we translate it from the original language, it actually means city of reeds. Okay? City of reeds. Now, this is important because we have to understand exactly what's being said. So when we're looking at a city of reeds, here he is at the city of reeds, and here he is at a wedding. And so let's look at Isaiah 42 real quick. Isaiah 42. Verses 1 through 3. This is my servant. I strengthen him. This is my chosen one. I delight in him. I have put my spirit on him. He will bring justice to the nations, and he will not cry out or shout or make his voice heard in the streets. He will not break a bruised reed, and he will not put out a smoldering wick. He will, he will faithfully bring justice. Now, if, is it significant to you that he's in a place called the city of reeds, and prophecy is that he will not break a, broke, a bruised reed? It, that may be a reach for you, but it wasn't for me. Because I've got to tell you something. How many of you feel that you're bruised reeds? Come on, let's get real. Aren't we? Man, I'm going to tell you something. Every time that I think that I'm getting close to getting it together, something else comes up. Right? And I find that there's more brokenness in me that needs to be healed. And you know what? It's really a good thing that he would not break a bruised reed. 
Because you know what happens when you break a bruised reed? It gets thrown away. It gets broken off and thrown away. What he's saying is that he came there for the lost sheep. He came there from the, for those who were bruised reeds, and he would not break them. He'd heal them. Do you get this? This is amazing stuff. Because who would go, go figure? Because you know what? In my mind, when Yeshua was walking around in, over there, it was kind of like he, in my mind he was staying in Judah, right? Come on. Let's get real. Doesn't it? Don't you? But he spent a whole huge amount of time in, in the northern kingdom. In fact, so much time that, that they, in Judah, they called him, aren't, they said to him, aren't you a Samaritan and have a demon? You see what I mean? So even Judah recognized that you're spending far too much time up there. You know? So... So here he is, and, and, and he's, he's, he's going to be to performing his first sign in this place called City of Reeds. And then we went into the idea that, that there were some significant numbers. Let's read that passage in John. Uh, John chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. I just want to read it. And on the third day, a wedding, wedding took place in Cana of Galilee. Yeshua's mother was there, and Yeshua and his disciples were, were invited to the wedding as well. When the wine ran out, Yeshua's mother told him, they don't have any wine. What has this concern of yours to do with me, woman? Uh, Yeshua asked. He says, my hour has not yet come. Do whatever he tells you, his mother told his servants. Now, six stone jars had been set there for Jewish purification. Each contained 20 or 30 gallons. Fill the jars with water, Yeshua told them. So they filled them to the brim. Then he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief servant. And they did. When the chief servant tasted the water after it had been, become wine, he did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. He called the groom and, and told him, Everyone sets out the, the fine wine first, then after, every has every, after people have drunk freely, the inferior. But you have kept the, the fine wine until now. Yeshua performed his first sign in Cana of Galilee, and he displayed his glory, and his disciples believed him. And after this, he went down to Capernaum uh, together with his mother, his brothers, and his disciples. They stayed there a few days. Now, in, we, we see right up front in that first verse that I read that, he, that it says that he was there, on, it says on the third day. And we, remember, we went back and we took a look at, at this idea of a third day. And we went back to Genesis chapter 1, verses 9 through 13, and we find out that during the creation story, okay, it was the third day that the water separated and the dry land came forth and it says specifically in there so that the land could produce seed. Fruit. Okay? Now we find the, the third day is significant because Yeshua also made the comment that on the third day I will complete my work. He was the third hour that they hung him on the execution stake. And it was the third day that he raised from the dead as the first fruit. So what he was saying is it's time, it's time for me to go and it's time for me to show you the fruit of your salvation. Me. Right? He says, I'm going to open this up to you. I'm going to show you who, who is the fruit? I'm going to show you who's first fruit. I'm going to show you your salvation. Let's get excited. We talked about the red heifer this morning. The idea of purification. And you know what? It ties in. All this ties in. And you know what? We've missed it because quite frankly, I don't think we were looking for signs.
Now, in verses, in chapter, chapter 2, verses 3 and 6, we see, we have to look closely as something unheard of happened. They ran out of wine at a wedding. That was not supposed to happen. Okay, because that really looked bad for the groom and the bride to run out of wine. Right? So Mary's, Mary, Yeshua's mother, comes to him and says, Hey, look, um, they ran out of wine here. Okay, and, and he, says, he says back to her, says, and the way that it's written here in the English, it says, what does this concern of yours have to do with me, woman? Now, in the original language, when you translate out this literally, what he is actually saying is this. He says, what concern of that, what, what does this, how does this concern you and I? Because they're not the people at the wedding. They're guests. Right? Now, he wasn't being rude. He was just asking how that had, what concern that it would have been for both of them to be there. For him to do something about it, right? Now, being the good Jewish mother that she was, she goes and tells the service, do whatever he says. Right? So he has them go fill up six purification jars made of stone. Now, this is significant. Once again, he calls for the number six. The number six was the sixth day that man was created. It was the sixth day that serpent was created. Man was to work. In Exodus, man was to work six days. So we can look at these six jars... And we can say, okay, they, they would represent, according to Scripture, if we follow that number six through, they would re- represent man and man's work. Okay? Now, what were these purification jars? Well, according to Scripture, the priests that worked within the tabernacle, Aaron and his sons, had a big bowl, if you will, Okay, and what they were to do was they were to wash their hands and their feet before they went and served Yahweh. Okay, and then they were clean. Well, later on they took they took a passage. The rabbis took a passage and said, and it was about a discharge for man. It was in uh, Leviticus fifteen eleven, I believe it is. They, they said, if a man has a discharge and you find him clean, he's to wash his hands and his feet, and he'd be clean. Now, the rabbi said, okay, well, there's no longer a temple, really, to do sacrifice and to, to work. We're all priests, so we all have to wash our hands and our feet. And so everywhere they went, when somebody entered the house, when somebody was going to eat, when somebody went, went into the synagogue, when, you know, whatever, they would wash their hands and feet. Think about this. They were being clean. You remember Yeshua and his disciples were eating wheat on a Sabbath. And one of the things that he said to them is that your disciples are eating without washing their hands and their feet. And you remember Yeshua said, what goes into the mouth and out does not defile a man. Okay, now he was not attacking whether they were eating the right foods or not. Okay, what he was saying was, is that your hands and feet won't defile you spiritually. You see what I mean? Now here is the point that we have to make, is that these six jars were at the wedding, which means that all of the guests would have had their hands and their feet washed, before they entered into eating and the festivities, okay? Thinking that they were ritually and morally clean. So when he targeted, and Scripture says that they were specifically the stone jars used for purification, when he targeted those, 
what he was targeting was man's, a, a man trying or attempting to make himself clean. Okay? So he had him fill it with water, representing man and man's work. And he turned that into wine. What he was saying was this, is I'm going to visit man in man's day of labor, and I'm going to provide a way for him to be clean. We find Yeshua himself identifying the wine as what? His blood. Right? Come on. That makes a man clean. You get this? I don't know about you, but this is exciting stuff. All through Scripture, we find pictures and symbols of Yeshua and Yeshua's work. Can you get this? Can you get your head around this? And where was he showing the work? <laughs> Just northern kingdom. You and I. You and I. That he would be the sacrifice. Because, you know what? When I do get to the next passage, we're going to find out that he left the northern kingdom and went to Judah and went to the temple as the Passover. It was the first steps of making the two sticks one. You see, if he had not come and he had not paid the price that was needed, if he had not been the Passover lamb, there wouldn't have been a kingdom for him to rule because nobody would be qualified to be in the kingdom. So he had to come as the lamb first so that he could cleanse his people so that they would be in the kingdom. So that they could be righteous. So when we look at this, these symbols... When we look at these things, we cannot just isolate them and get them alone. And if you remember, and I'm going to talk probably, I'm, I'm just going to cut this short today because I really felt it necessary to talk about this again. Because I don't think that we can talk enough about this. Because you know what? It's, it, it, we've talked about it, and I'm going to talk a bit about it again next week. It's not okay. It's not enough to look like Israel. We can only be Israel when we're covered in the blood. You see, because then we can produce the fruit. Right? And see, when I look at this, I have to go back to, to, to look at my own life. And I'm saying, what am I still, what in my life am I still trying to cleanse myself and make myself clean. You see, for, 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 for most of us, if we really look, we'll find that we still have six stone jars full of water. And we're still trying to clean certain places in our life ourselves. Would we have to get that part under the blood too? You see, we'll never be able to clean ourselves. Our works will never happen. That's what he was saying, is that I'm going to end. The only way that, I, that I, can, I can cover man, the only way that I can clean man is to come to man in man's time of his labor and clean him up so that he can enter into the day of rest.
You get this? You see, as long as we're still trying to clean ourselves with our own labor, we won't be able to enter the rest. That's why we have turmoil, is we're still trying to do stuff our way. We're still trying to cleanse ourselves. That's why I appreciate my wife. (laughs) Bringing Psalm 91. I told her, I said, man, I'm mad at you. I said, but I love you. (laughs) Because you know what? We get focused on the wrong stuff. And we need to learn. We need to learn that the stuff of this world isn't worth looking at. We also need to learn that we'll never end. You know, you know what's bugged me forever? Shabbat Shalom. What does that mean? Right? Shabbat Shalom. There's got to be something about peace and fightings because that's what we do. Right? I don't know. I don't get it. But I'm starting to get it. Because you know what? The truth is, we're still trying to do stuff our own. And we're not experiencing His shalom. Because if we were, if we were under His authority all the way, we'd be experiencing the shalom. Remember, he's known as the Prince of what? Prince of Shalom. You see, if I come under his authority in everything in my life, do you get this? If I come under his authority with everything in my life, if I allowed him to have charge of everything in my life, I have no choice but to experience Shalom because he's the Prince of Shalom. You get that? And you know what? Here's the thing. It's just like the... I want to go back to that Psalm 91. I want to go back to that for a minute. You, if, if, you don't, if you didn't like me going over this stuff again today, you can blame Sharon. <laughs> because she got me thinking... The one who lives under the protection of... Did you get that? The one who lives under the protection of the Most High. Okay? The one who lives under the protection of the Most High. The one who lives under the protection of the Most High. I'm saying this not for you, for me, because it says that I need to dwell. I need to live under the protection of the Most High. It didn't say if he chooses you, you can live in the protection. He didn't say that, that someday we'll live in the protection. He said the one that lives under the protection of the Most High. Dwells in the shadow of the Almighty. I thought about that as I'm getting in, in, three, in as, as I'm taking a shower today. What does it mean to be to dwell in the shadow? Have you ever been in the shadow of a tree? Have you ever been in a hot, hot day? I'm going to tell you something. There was a time in my life when I was in the army, and we were serving, we were training in a place called Fort Irwin, California, which is just above Death Valley. It was 120 when they shut us down. And it was not the heat of the day. And you know what? When, when I thought about that, what I thought about is those periods of time, that heat, and being able to come into the shade and have protection from the heat. It says, those that dwell under his protection also dwell in his shadow. Did you get that?
I will say to, to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, he himself will deliver you from the hunter's net and from the destructive plague. He will cover you with his feathers and will take refuge under his wings. His faithfulness will be a protective shield. Listen to me. His faithfulness is a protective shield for us. Not our faithfulness. It doesn't depend on our faithfulness. It depends on His. You will not fear terror of the night, the arrow that flies by day, the plague that strikes in darkness, or the pestilence that ravages at noon. Though a thousand fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, the pestilence will not reach you. You will see, you will see it with your eyes and witness the punishment of the wicked. He didn't say you're going to experience, he said you're going to see this happen. You know, sometimes what we do is we get so uptight and so caught up in those that are falling around us that we become, we become focused on that and we forget where we are. And so we start, start into a spirit of anxiety based upon what's happening to others and not once stopping to think about that I'm in His protection. I don't have to worry about that. He's got it. You see, this is all tying together because it's, it's about His covering. It's about His blood that covers us. It's not about what we can do for our salvation. It's about His covering. It's about what His work was done. It was about Him coming to man in man's day of labor and, and giving us the sacrifice that was needed so that we would be able to enter into the seventh day, the rest. It's not what I planned on preaching today. But I'm going to tell you something. Everything changed this morning. Blame her. Isn't it good to have wives? I was sweat then I was sweating over, oh no, I'm not gonna preach what I've been working on all week. Do that next week. you know, here we are. We're really in a place of decision. You see, here we are. This is still the time of man. This is still the time of man's labor. We can still have his covering and his protection. All we got to do is surrender to him and step into his protection and his shadow. It doesn't matter what happens. He didn't say, he didn't say I'll protect you as long as, as uh, the governments are not messing with you. If the governments are messing with you, forget it. All bets are off. He didn't say that. He said no matter what happens. Right? Right. We're, I'm busy looking at the website and now we're sending weapons to Syria and... You know, and I'm thinking, what is wrong with going? What is this? They're a bunch of nitwits. Where has this ever worked before? Right? But you know what? It doesn't matter. Because it, by his blood, we've been placed in his protection. All we have to do, listen to me, all we have to do is be washed by the word from that point on. That puts us in, in his authority. It's called obedience. You get that? 
And as long as we're there, we're protected. So let them shoot at each other in Syria. We're protected. Let the terrorists run around. We're protected. Right? You know, I often wonder how that these uh, apostles and so forth faced the things that they faced at the ends of their lives. And it's because of this. They knew who their protector was. You know that? They had faith in him. And they realized that it wasn't about the time of man. And they had a real strong faith that when they stepped out, they were going to enter into that rest. Amen? You see, it really comes down to a choice for us. He has provided everything already. His work is complete already. Do you get that? That's why it says that when he, when he went to the right hand of the Father, he sat down, showing that it was a finished work. He completed his work as the Lamb and as man's salvation, right? That's done. Is, it, is there going to be more work? Yeah, but next time it's going to be that he's coming as the Messiah and he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna kick some antichrist butt. And he's going to take the land back and we're going to dwell in it, Right? And we're going to enter in to his rest. Okay. I'm done. Maybe you know where I've been all morning. <laughs> I may have <clears throat> shared this before, probably, but uh, I think... I want to share it again. It's <laughs> Psalm 91. <laughs> There's a, another pastor's wife up in Montana, and she was out uh, by herself in the dark, and there were some young guys following her, and they began to attack her, and she was thinking, <clears throat> always remember the word when you're in trouble. She couldn't remember the word. All she could remember with Psalm 91 was the feathers. So she said, the feathers, the feathers. <laughs> and the guys looked at her and they ran the other way. <laughs> so even if you can remember part of the, of the psalm. Speak it. Well, you know, I got a, a, a little story. When I, was, when I first went to pastor a, a, a congregation in Newport, they told me that um, some other pastor came around me and said, hey, listen, um, the golf course here gives pastors free golf on Mondays. I'm going, well, that's not going to do me any good because I don't golf, right? And they said, come on, we'll teach you. And I said, okay. So I went out there my first day, and they kind of showed me how to swing and everything. We're on the second hole, and it turns out that I have a slice. I went a long ways, but it went the wrong way. You know what I mean? And it went into, it, it was headed into this, this tree line when the Catholic priest came walking out of the tree line. And it was headed right, headed right for him. Now, I haven't golfed before, but I was a military man, so I yelled incoming. <laughs> and the ball hit about four feet away from him and bounced. And he, he, casual, he just was real casual about it. And he co was casually walking by me, and he goes, So, Rick, are you trying to start the Reformation again? <laughs> in the in the Torah portion um, it talks about um, an open vessel that's that's in a tent when someone dies and the um, the open vessel 
it needs to have a covering on it. But if it's open, it has a meaning in the Hebrew of to cease or perish, consume away or destroy or utterly waste away. But if it's got a covering on it, the same Hebrew word for this vessel um, is finished and fulfilled. And so this, this open vessel, which has no cover fastened on it, it says is unclean. And so Messiah Yeshua is our covering on this. We're the vessel. And so we need this covering. And it reminded me of a friend of mine years ago that he um, had a daughter that he sent off to a university. And she stayed on campus with her girlfriends. And, and um, they were, the girls went to a mall together in their car. Now this car that um, my friend prepared for her daughter went over it really well. He was a mechanic and so he went over it really well, made sure it was nice and solid for her so she wouldn't have any trouble with it. Well, when they went to this mall to park, these, these boys were following them and had followed them in their pickup truck. So they thought, well, well, we'll stop in at this mall and see if we can shake them. And they weren't shaking them, they, they were following them around. And so they came back out to get in their car and the boys were right on them as soon as they got in and locked the door. And they were shaking the car, trying to get in, get them to come out. And so the girls started praying well, they tr were trying to start the car, and it wouldn't. When they turned the key, there was just nothing. Nothing happened. And um, so, come to find out later that the um, the boys had removed the battery out of the car, and uh, it was the older car, so that you could just pop the hood from out front and remove the battery. So the girls started praying. And um, they turned the key again, and it started, and they drove away. That would have freaked me out. <laughs> and so the boys just all jumped back away from the car and just stood there and stared as it drove away. And when they got home, they opened up the hood, and, and the, her, their girlfriends that she was staying with, dad came out, and they told him the story and lifted up the hood, and there's no battery. Wow. And my friend said they were hooked up something more powerful than a 12-volt battery. Amen. Can, you, can you imagine what the guy thought that was holding the battery? <laughs> right. Can't take our power. Um, I just wanted to um, expound on that, the idea of covering. Um, I know... The reason we wear these, the tzitzit, um, it's from Numbers 15, 37, where Yahweh tells Moshe to tell the, the uh, children of Israel to tie on them fringes. And I have the word fringe pulled up in the Hebrew here, tzitzit. Um, it's uh, the feminine version. It means a floral or wing-like projection. This is to remind us of the commandments as we practice them, we are covered under his wings. And it's, it's really it, more of a sentence on us to remind us to keep the commandments. It's a promise that we're mm -hmm. covered under his wings. Amen. Um, I had a question about what you said in the beginning um so the gospel so if if we take the gospel sp spread the good news spread the gospel bring it to other people i understand it's not about faith you know uh when i you know just have faith or just believe in god or or you need god and they say okay and we that's it so so in light of all of this what what, what would be the gospel that you take to people well and like I said, that what, what we've been doing in the church for many years 
is, is like a partial. Okay, but the idea of, of needing a Messiah and who, who needed a Messiah and so forth is what we're not teaching. Okay, so when we're proclaiming the gospel, there's more than just proclaiming the gospel than just one event that takes place. We're, compla- we're complaining. We're proclaiming the gospel today. Okay, and so we, we fall short of saying, okay, what is this? What, why do I need why do I need Jesus? Well, to forgive us of our sins. Well, that's true. But there's more to it than that. There's a whole lot more to it than that. Because it goes to, you know, what about the bride? What about, what about the covering? What about the, the, the idea that we're grafted in? And see, those are things that are not being taught. And so we're walking around today, and, and be, basically people are saying, well, I've accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, but have no idea really what that means. Because what they did was, was accept Yeshua Messiah. So now they have a Messiah, and that's what Ephesians chapter 2 says. It says, the once you were far off, once you were strangers, once you were away from the, the citizenship of Israel, but now have been brought near. Now you have a Messiah. Now you are Israel. You're, you're part of the commonwealth of Israel. You see what I mean? And so, so we, when we preach the whole gospel, it begins to change the, the way we look at how we should live. You see what I mean? Because now, now I'm, I'm a citizen. You know, it's, it's like people that move to America or, or, or another country, and they get there and get in trouble because they didn't know the ways. Right? Well, we bring all these people in, to a Messiah and then not tell him what it's about, right? You see what I mean? And so basically what we're doing is we're birthing babies and leaving them on the doorstep to die. You see what I mean? Because we're not teaching them what it means to be saved. So that's what I was getting at. But the first, but then the, the follow-up of that question, the first step, I guess, is pretty. You do share the love of Yeshua with others, or the love of Jesus, whatever the person where they're at. I mean, you wouldn't want to share. Well, do you know Yeshua loves you? Who's Yeshua? Well, you might clarify that, but you just you, you start there. Mm-hmm. It's not like you don't start there. I think is what you're. I'm right, just clarifying right. it, that. Yeah, it's not. It's not about the starting place, but it's about a continuation. But I'm just clarifying with what you're saying. I'm just kind of a question statement. That's where you start, though. You start with the fact that you're a sinner, and you do need, you do need a savior. Well, and it, if, it depends on who you're talking to, too, because if you're talking to people that are in the church that already, just I'm talking you know, about non, yeah. like non people that don't believe, don't right. don't know what they believe, they don't believe anything, right? And you're trying to share with them that you're um, a sinner, right? And, that and their current, uh, yeah. Just, the other thing too is to you. I mean, you could even present it to where, you know, because of the sin that took place, they were broken away. You see, from the, from the tree, from the olive tree, or whatever, you could, you could put it like that, but you could be grafted in. You see what I mean? And, and go from there. I mean, you could give them a lot, you know. Okay, well, that, that clarifies that. And then just another comment, because uh, I remember when I was growing up and in college, um, I didn't, I, I, in church, the churches taught the grace of God, and, and it wasn't a cheap grace, but it was just, that's what it was about, and it was about the grace. And it wasn't like you had never asked forgiveness. I mean, there was things you did try to live a good life. Mm-hmm. But um, I remember g- going through college and a lot of things happening in my life, but I just remember it being so real to me, and it drew me and it kept me that Yeshua, Jesus, like, loved me no matter what I did. And I was really messed up for a lot of my life, and I was a Christian at that time, too. I was messed up and a Christian for many years. And I just remember having that reality in my mind and heart that, like, it was so real that his love, he loved me. Mm-hmm. And I was, here I was, the exact opposite of what he needed, wanted me to be. And I didn't just change when I realized his love. I kept doing those things. But I, I knew that he loved me, and it, like, it kind of drove me. I mean, I, eventually I did. His love helped me. Eventually I came out of those things. But it was many, many years, and it was like, so God's grace is so, I, mean, I think maybe we miss that sometimes because there's so much more too 
But mm -hmm. the grace and the forgiveness, and he loves you. I mean, in the midst of just the worst person you could be, he, he loves you. No more, no more or less than he does when you turn to him. And I just remember that, that, that love being so real through college and, and just like, if I didn't know that, I think I, w I wouldn't have been. I remember the things I was doing, I thought, man, this isn't me. I don't know why I'm doing this. I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. Um, but I knew it wasn't who I was. Mm -hmm. But it, it still, I struggled, you know. But his love was what kind of kept me kind of going. I don't know where I was going, but his love was there. And it, was, it was real. So. It, was all, it was always kind of ambiguous to me because, um, you know, not to say that I didn't believe that he, he saved me, but the idea of, you know, because this whole idea of a new creation, what does that mean? You know, I mean, um, frankly, I'm not li living anything like the, the new creation, you know, because I'm still living the old way. You know, and I, it was like a, 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 a group of uh, some kids that, that uh, actually received Yeshua th in, during Chuck Smith's ministry back when, they, back when they were hippies, you know, in the hippie days. How many of you remember the hippie days? Oh, yeah. Anyway, back in those days, okay, when, um, and they got saved, you know, and that's all the farther that anybody took them. And so they said it was really cool, and we were really excited, so we went out and smoked a joint to celebrate. <laughs> you, see, you see what I mean? I, because nobody told them anything further than, now you're saved, right? And so here they are, and, and it says, it took them a while, and they're going, I don't think that was cool, you know? <laughs> so I get off. But, but it's like that. You get saved, and then you learn and learn and learn, and then you kind of, maybe you lose your first love, like you, yeah. you talked about, too. Yeah. And... It's like if you just drop everything you want to learn and just know that he loves you no matter what you do, that's the heart that's going to want to be obedient to him anyway. I mean, that's the whole point of the, everything is, 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 is the relationship. And anyway, I just remember it being so real for me. So. Okay. Um, the thing that struck me was uh, Robin's question about the tzitzit and the covering and the shadow, which in the Hebrew is tzel, and I'm connecting the word tzel, shadow, with tzitzit. They both start with the tzadi, and I looked that up in Psalm 118, the tzadi portion, and it, it, his covering is his word. It's also his blood. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of picking up that we have a different way to talk to people as we're talking about this salvation. And in the prayer room, which is where I've been when you guys have been doing the Torah portions, it's been a big blessing to have things come together. But we looked at the word Nasag. Um, it's out of Deuteronomy chapter 28, and um, you should read verse 1, but it's in verse 2. It's about the blessings that will come and overtake you. Nasag is the overtake. Um, some other, I don't remember all the other meanings, but wax, rich, attain. And then when you get to the curses for disobedience, those can overtake you also. But the point in one is now if you faithfully obey Yahweh your Elohim and are careful to follow all his commands I'm giving you today, he will put you far above all the nations of the earth. So, okay, in being Torah observant, does it mean that now, like, whenever there was a sin sacrifice called for in Torah, we take that same sin that we sinned, and instead of offering two doves or a bull or whatever we were supposed to offer, we instead get on our knees and plead Yeshua's blood over it? Mm -hmm. So and everything he, outlined in Torah that used to require a sin sacrifice, now right. we take to Yeshua. Yeshua, yeah. And um, we're told by, um, by Shaul to present ourselves as a living sacrifice to him. So it would be, it would be a laying down of my, of my life and what's in it for him, okay, so, meaning in obedience. So the sacrifice is, is actually him now, okay, versus an animal. And us. Huh? And us as a living sacrifice. Right, right, right. 
I didn't hear what you said, so that's why I looked Sorry. at you. <laughs> okay, uh. so we, we ask forgiveness, admit, we come back to him, teshuva. Um, yeah, teshuva also, that's a, we, most often we hear to it, it, repent, and, and we, we get that as well, just ask for forgiveness, but teshuva is actually turning to him. Okay, turning our face to his face. Yeah, repentance is a 180 from what we were doing before. Right. Teshuvah is coming back to him, right. right? Right. So we do that, and in that way, we're sacrificing ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. We're not living for ourselves anymore. Right. right. And asking his blood to cover that, it's that sin as well. Right. What is part of being Messiahship? Was part of that being king and set ourselves under his rule? So... Um, does that help? Yeah. Well, I yeah, I struggled with that. Like he was saying, much of my life, I've been a Christian for so many years, and I committed all my sins and about every sin I possibly could as a Christian. But what you're saying is, ask forgiveness. I say that. I'll I'll say that. Forgive me, uh, and then I, I. But I stop and say, I know you have forgiven me. It's not if you are living the Torah and you are a living sacrifice you're already forgiven you don't have to ask for forgiveness it's all about Teshuvah it, I, I stop and say and I know you have forgiven me just help me to Teshuvah to change this in my life so it's a different perspective from looking at it and, know if I'm, you know what I mean. Yeah, I just told him I was sorry and hung out in the same place, you know, back then. <laughs> so. Anyone else? Yeah, okay. there's always one. Oh. I just want to thank you and Sharon for coming to a different place for your message today because I think you got your directions from on high. Yeah, and they weren't for you necessarily. <laughs> Did you have some? Oh, are you ready? How about if you stand for the blessing? Now remember, we're going to do uh, <laughs> the Braca. I got it right this week, the Braca. Okay. And so file into there, get your juice. Stay in there, and then when we get through with the Baraka, go back through the line for the Onek. And Yahweh spoke to, to Moshe, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, This is how you bless the children of Israel. Say to them, Yahweh bless you and, and guard you. Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and show favor to you. Yahweh lift up his face upon you and give you peace. Thus they shall put my name on the children of Israel, and I myself shall bless them. Yivarecha Yahweh v'yishmarecha Ya'er Yahweh panavalecha v'chunecha Yesa Yahweh panavalecha Ve'asem lecha shalom. Bring us back to you, Yahweh, and we shall return. Renew our days as of old. Amen. <laughs>